I'm supposed to talk on how to manage a patient with an examinating pelvic injury. I'll be focusing on uh, principles of uh, emergency management, how to integrate imaging, resuscitation, and interventions. Because like when you deal with a patient who's got an examinating pelvic injury, what you do not have is time. And we have seen in a lot of instances, unnecessary time is being wasted on imaging modalities that does offer a lot of information with regards to the injury, yes, but they are not relevant with regards to dealing with a bleeding pelvic fracture, that is to keep the patient alive. So I would sort of like look into these principles and give you a brief detail about it. So this is the disclaimer that Striker India wanted us to have, and these are my personal disclosures, and none of them have any relevance to the talk. So if you look at the uh, incidence of mortality after a pelvic injury, it is around 17, 17 percentage for a closed fracture. And we are not including the fragility fractures that we often encounter nowadays in the elderly population. These are data about high velocity pelvic injuries. And the number goes up to 45 percentage if you have an open pelvic ring injury. And the number is almost 60 percentage if you have a patient who's got a bleeding pelvic fracture with hemodynamic instability. So most often you will lose more than one out of two patients when you deal with a bleeding pelvic fracture. So when you treat a patient with a bleeding pelvic injury, it is all about time. Right from the pre-hospital care, which is sort of a weak link in our country, but we definitely have made a lot of strides in, even in this scenario over the last five to ten years. And once it is in your hospital, it depends on the expertise, the resources you have, and most importantly, the team, the skill set, and the ability of those individuals to work as a team, and also the kind of protocols you have. So I'm looking at the thing that you can do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Most often than not, you'll fail. So this is a patient who's got a uh, bleeding pelvic fracture, he presented to us with shock, BP 9060, tenderness on examination, blood meatus. And if I ask you, what would be your first choice of investigation to what to see what exactly is there? Would you take an AP pelvic radiograph in a portable manner? Would you opt for a pelvic series radiographs that would include an inlet and outlet views along with the AP pelvis? Or an AP pelvis and a quick CT if your institution allows that? So, I, we don't have an ARS system here, but, but I can tell you, I've asked this question before and quite a few people have opted for AP pelvis with the CT. For them, CT is indispensable, but I can tell you CT has no role when you are dealing with a patient with a bleeding pelvic injury. All you require is just an AP pelvis radiograph and if you can take it in a portable manner, it's brilliant. So, basically, imaging in a pelvic injury would depend primarily on the patient's hemodynamic status. So if you have a patient who's unstable hemodynamically, then you have to rely on imaging that quickly diagnoses all primary and associated lesions which may have an influence on the life. And these investigations should be able to be carried out as part of the resuscitative measures and not separately. They shouldn't take any time out of your resuscitation. If you have a stable patient by blood, then that's great. You can do whatever imaging techniques that you want to diagnose, classify, and then plan your definitive treatment at leisure. So if you take a patient with an unstable bleeding pelvic fracture, if you, this is the AP pelvis that you typically get. And this AP pelvic x-ray can give you a lot of information. If you look at them deeply, you can appreciate a superior pelvic ramen fracture on the right. You can also see a disruption of the left sacroiliac joint. Even though not greatly projected, you can appreciate something that is going on in the left ileum. You can also see the asymmetry in the obstetral foramen indicating an inferior pubic ramai fracture as well. And if you can take your time and draw these lines, you can also appreciate the kind of rotational and vertical instability that this patient has. All these things can give you a whole deal of information in order to guide resuscitative treatment. So in, in order to guide resuscitative treatment, all you need is an AP pelvic x-ray. So once you've got your AP pelvis, what about next? The patient is bleeding. You do not know where the bleeding comes from, either from the pelvis or from an extra pelvic source. The most common extra pelvic sources are the abdomen, thorax, and the cranium. 
of these abdomen is the most important. So if you want to rule out an intra-abdominal bleed, the best thing in that situation would be to do an ultrasound, preferably portable again. The problem with ultrasound is it lacks sensitivity and is extremely user dependent. So other thing that you can do is do a diagnostic peritoneal tap. It is reliable, but it is invasive, but it works. And if you can combine these two techniques, which can be done very quickly, it makes the entire process extremely reliable in picking up an intra-abdominal bleed. The, th the question that often comes to our mind is like, instead of doing all these things, can we subject a patient to a quick CD scan? I can tell you it is not recommended because however quick you may be, whatever good your CT suit may be, I can tell you it is not the great place to assess station. So any patient who is like hemodynamically unstable should not go out of your sight and resuscitation is the key. Investigation should be done concurrently and not separately. So you have done your fast diagnostic peritoneal tap. It is negative, ruling out an intra-abdominal bleed, but your patient is not improving hemodynamically. So what to do next? It is quite logical at this point that the, the bleeding is coming from the pelvic fracture and you got to stop it. So how to go about it? There are two schools of thoughts here, depending on institutionalized protocol, what the team believes and on what they are trained on. So one school of thought is to go again and do a pre-peritoneal pelvic packing with an external fixator. What does it do? It creates a tamponade effect, closes down the pelvic volume, and since most of your bleed comes from skeletal and small veins, this works most of the time. And this does not require anything great. The other school of thought is to go again and do an angiography and then an embolization. The basis for this is most of the life-threatening bleeds, even though the incidence of arterial bleeds is extremely low in a pelvic fracture, if they are present, they can be life-threatening. And if you can have angioembolization in your protocol, you might end up saving a lot of lives. So I will just look into the pros and cons of either of these two school of thoughts and also tell you what we prefer. If you look at therapeutic angiography, the success rates of angioembolization varies between 75 and 100 percentage in indicated cases. So that's brilliant. Even though there are some instances of need for repeat embolization in up to 40 percentage have been reported. This is primarily due to dislodgement of the gel foam if you use it and even coils. And some papers have even reported bleed at a new site. If you look at the mortality rates after therapeutic embolization, if you look at the earlier studies actually, this is the data from the earlier studies, it goes up up to almost 90 percentage. And it, most of this mortality is not primarily due to embolization per se, but it is due to the time taken for the institute or the team to do embolization. Because like a lot of times, if they are doing it on a case by case basis, and if they do not have existing protocols, it takes a lot of time to find those available interventionists, keep, uh, find those expertise and then prepare them. So it takes a lot of time. So timing is the key with regards to angiobolization. So with regards to therapeutic angiography, the problem is like, as I said, well, arterial bleeding accounts for major bleeding in the pelvic fracture only 15% of the time. So if you take all pelvic fractures in total, only less than 2% of pelvic fractures may actually need angiography. Our patients will might benefit from it. So this is a quite a labor intensive and exhaustive exercise for less than 2% of patients. And if you do not have all these setups in place, and if you, as I said, if you do it on a case by case basis, even if your patient requires an angiography, actually less than half of the patients ultimately undergo it because the delay takes a toll and sometimes you may lose your patients. So angio embolization depends primarily on availability and a lot of expertise. So what are the role of contrast CT at this point? So contrast CT as we know has got a very quick turnaround time and it can predict accurately the need for angiography. So you can, if you are relying on angiography, what you can better do is like do a contrast CT scan and if the contrast CT scan is negative, you can forget about the angiograph. You don't need it. So it saves time and a lot of expertise. And if your contrast CT is positive with intravascular extravasation of contrast from either large or medium-sized vessels, it suggests a, suggests a strong need for embolization and you got to wrap it up. So what about the second school of thought, pre-peritoneal pelvic packing? 
The concept of preterritorial territory parking was introduced by Tim Pohlmann from Germany, and it involves application of an anterior exfix and packing the preperitoneal area by using upon responders. It creates a pelvic tamponade, which is often sufficient to stop bleeds that are coming from small and even up to mid-sized vessels. And using these protocols worldwide, there has been a reported reduction in mortality of more than 20% compared to the previous angel embolization protocols. So how, does it, how, how is it done? It's an extremely easy technique, like uh, you use a midline uh, vertical incision and then like get into the uh, post-symphysial area, it just takes 10-15 minutes to do it. Apply the X-Fix, unless you apply the X-Fix, you can't close the pelvic ring and you can't control the volume. And then once that is done, start packing the para uh, area, starting from the pre area, then come up anteriorly. There is enough space actually, the hematoma pre creates a lot of cleavage there, and then pack them continuously using four to six pads. It is capable of stopping most of the bleeds. And what we have observed is like, once we do the pelvic packing, there is dramatic reduction in the amount of blood transfusion these patients require. So in the ER, when it starts, like probably when we take them to packing, the patients might have already required four to six units of blood. But once the packing is done, most often it stops abruptly. And it requires no special expertise, no iron resources are required. We can do it, it's a simple technique. The only problem is that you need to remove them. Initially, people removed them at 48 hours, but that had an unacceptable infection rate. So now the current protocol is to remove them safely at 24 hours. The other problem is infection. Up to 10 to 15 percentage of infection has been reported, and the infection rate is quite high if you are dealing with an open fracture or a bladder injury that requires intervention. So what we follow is sort of the pelvic uh, preperitoneal packing protocol, which we learned from, which I learned from Denver Health Medical Center during my fellowship. So what we do is like the patient is applied a pelvic binder or a sheet on site when they are picked up or at the earliest when, you, when they reach you at the hospital. And once your AP pelvic x-ray and fast peritoneal tap is done and you have sort of like narrowed it on the pelvis, but if your patient is still not improving, what I mean by not improving is like if the systolic BP doesn't go up by more than 90 milligram millimeters of mercury after two units of packed RBC transfusion. So if it doesn't happen, this is the time we think about taking the patient to the OR and do an external fixator and tell it back. So once pelvic packing is done, you can shift the patient to the ICU and think about further planning. But in case, if the patient continues to be unstable, even after you shift the patient from the OR, this is the time you should suspect a major vessel bleeding, either from the internal iliac or even from the superior root in the obturator. And this is the time you should think about a contrast CP and thereafter embolization. So what a pelvic packing does is it gives you time. It reduces the need for embolization. So this is their data from Denver Health Medical Center. If you look at their data, their main time they, that it took for them to take the patient to the OR was 66 minutes. And only 13% of patients subsequently required an angel embolization. And that too, it could be done at a mean of 10 hours. So it gives you a great deal of window apart from reducing the need for angel embolization. So in summary, if you have a bleeding pelvic fracture patient, if it's stable, no problem. You take an AP pelvis x-ray, do your further x-rays in and outlet if you require, do your CD scans, go ahead and plan your definitive fixation. But if you have an unstable patient with hemodynamic instability, then rule out extra pelvic sources of bleed. If they are present, they have to be dealt with appropriately. And if you have narrowed your bleed down to the pelvic fracture, and if the patient is not hemodynamically improving, then you need to intervene. Intervene, we prefer to do it by using an external fixator and preperitoneal packing. And if the patient continues to be unstable, then do a contrast CT. If there is extravasation of contrast on the CT scan, then subject them to pelvic arteriography and subsequent embolization. And once they have become stable, and if they become stable, then you can think about planning your definitive fixation. Thank you.